Good morning. I'm David Mandel from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. My visual description is I'm male, medium complexion, wearing glasses. I have a predominant dark brown and gray beard. I'm wearing a navy blue shirt. I'm sitting in front of a dark brown wood bookcase filled with books. Before we get started today, I'll do a brief access check to talk about the accommodations that we have set up today. Uh, volume and speed check. Can you hear me? Let me know if I'm speaking too fast. If you're joining us today with Zoom video, we have both American Sign Language Interpretation and Captioning, courtesy of LC Interpreting Services. We'd like to thank our interpreters and captioners for their services today. I'd like to thank them by name. Bonnie Rothermel, our captioner, Maria Cardoza, and Veronica Staley, our interpreters. If you are joining us via Zoom video and desire captioning, please refer to the button on the bottom of your screen marked CC or closed captions. In the settings, you can turn on and enlarge a full transcript of the captions. We also have American Sign Language Interpretation. Because we are in a webinar, we have taken the necessary steps to ensure that interpreter will be visible at all times as a panelist, part of the gallery view. Although the program is a webinar rather than a meeting, we want to encourage thoughts, questions, and ideas from the audience. Because of time constraints, we are conscious we may not get to all of these. There are a few ways to submit questions and we wanna make sure everyone has access. So if you would like to pose a question and you are using Zoom video platform, please use the question and answer feature on the bottom of the screen. There will be a specific section when we are calling for questions, but you can use the Q and A feature to ask questions at any time throughout the event. The chat feature will not be available please do not use the chat for questions. Please use the Q&A so we do not miss anything. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible. For anyone calling on their phone today, questions may be called or texted to the phone number 917-969-6702 at any time during the program. I'll repeat that number. 917-969-6702. To enable clear communication during this program, please note all of your mics will be muted. And since some people may be joining by phone or may not view images on the screen, we would ask the panelists to please announce your name each time you speak, as this is important as well for the captioners who are working today. This concludes our access check this morning. DCLA would like to take a moment to let all attendees know that this event will be recorded. DCLA intends to post this recording on our website at a later date and may use all or part of the recording in the future or authorize others to use it for non-commercial purposes consistent with our mission. If you do not wish your name to be included in this recording, please direct all communications to rsvp at culture.nyc.gov rather than using the Q&A feature. If you do not wish to have either your name or phone number visible to other participants or potential future viewers, we recommend that you exit this virtual event and watch the recording on our website when it is posted. I'm very happy to see that so many people are present in the audience today. With that said, it's my pleasure to turn the program over to Perry Ann Carson, Director of Community Arts Development. Good morning, Perry Ann. Good morning, David. I'm Perry Ann Carson, Director of Community Arts Development here at the Department of Cultural Affairs. My visual description, I am a white female with short brown hair, wearing eyeglasses and a navy turtleneck, and I'm sitting in front of a white wall. Today's webinar, Board Leadership in a Shifting Landscape, is part of a series of planned discussions intended to help cultural groups connect with and learn from one another, as well as to get the latest information from local government. This program is funded in part by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's 
Community Development Block Grant Program. I'd like to share a few post-event communications that you can expect from us. As David mentioned, the recording of this event will be posted on the DCLA website and a link will be sent via email to all registrants when these are available. A post webinar survey will be sent via email right after the event. We sincerely appreciate your responses as they help to inform future programs as well as to ensure compliance with the program's federal funding. I also want to alert you to a series of technical assistance convenings created by Cause Effective just for board members and designed to supplement today's conversation. You'll hear more about it later during the webinar and an email will follow describing how interested board members can participate. Today's program will be a discussion on how New York City's arts and cultural leaders are navigating changing conditions and tackling critical needs and opportunities. While individual and organizational health and survival remain front of mind, groups are also seizing this moment to experiment with ways to reach new audiences and supporters, to have frank conversations about cultural role in racial and social justice movements, and to explore whole new ways of operating. We have invited four remarkable New York City cultural leaders to share their journeys of learning and adapting, as well as to discuss how their organizations remain resilient in their efforts to carry out their mission in today's shifting landscape. We're very excited to have Judy Levine, Executive Director of Cause Effective as our moderator today. With over 30 years of experience as a nonprofit management advisor, Judy has trained and consulted with well over 1,000 nonprofit organizations on issues relating to board and organizational development, as well as fund diversification and donor engagement. Judy's commitment to social change has played a key role in Cause Effective's impact in the nonprofit sector. Cause Effective serves as a nonprofit growth partner and has worked with over 6,000 organizations in its 40 year history. Judy also brings her own experience as a board member to her work, having served in leadership positions on such boards as Church Street School for Music and Art, Transportation Alternative, and four New York City public school leadership teams. Judy served for 10 years as a selection committee member for the New York Community Trust Nonprofit Excellence Awards. And in 2017, she was honored as one of, as one of New York City's most distinguished public servants with city and state's 50 over 50 awards. And now Judy, I'll pass it off to you. Okay, and if I could see all the panelists um, now. Um, great. I, um, what we're speaking about today is, uh, I'm gonna introduce myself first. I'm Judy Levine, I'm the Executive Director of Cause Effective. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a visual representation for those who are, are not um, on the video. I have red hair, I'm a white female. Um, I'm wearing a green turtleneck with a black sweater with flowers on it. And behind me is um, the cause effective logo, you know, a green screen kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> what we're speaking about today is not normal good governance practices. We're, we're not, and we never will be again in the old normal times. Let's just start with that as a baseline. Um, someday soon, I hope, we'll start rebuilding a new normal. But for the past eight months, basically all bets have been off in a kind of a rapidly changing vortex. What we're gonna to explore today is how the boards of the organizations that are gonna be up here with me have added value and been true partners on this so stressful journey. I urge us all to listen for what are the stories and what are the principles that we can all adapt in our own leadership experience. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce the panelists now um, and then we'll uh, have them get going. First, I'm gonna talk about um, El Puente El Puente is a, a community-based human rights organization that promotes leadership for peace and justice through the holistic engagement of its members, youth and adults, in the arts, education, environmental justice, and community development. 
For nearly four decades, El Puente has accomplished numerous groundbreaking community-led social justice initiatives while pioneering a national model for holistic youth and community development. It currently integrates the diverse activities and community campaigns of El Puente Arts, the El Puente Green Light District, a holistic community sustainability initiative, and the Global Training Institute uh, within its six le youth leadership centers. Uh, it's public high school and community school in North Brooklyn and it's Latin, Latino Climate Action Network in Puerto Rico. Um, El Puente Arts is one of the most comprehensive Latino arts and cultural programs in Brooklyn. It provides pre-professional pre performing and visual arts training to youth age six to 21 and has received Van Leer fellowship grants to support additional professional arts training, coaching and mentoring for um, aspiring young artists. And joining us from El Puente today are um, Francis Lucerna, who is the president of the organization, and Mark Cologne, who is the chair of the board. Um, I'll introduce them for a second, and then we'll go on to the next organization, and then we'll start talking together as a group. So Francis Lucerna um, is a pioneer of community-driven arts and education who served her community of Williamsburg, Brooklyn for over four decades. In 1980, she founded the Williamsburg Art and Culture Council for Youth, uh, which was a performing arts and visual arts program for young people in Los Suarez. And in 1982, she co-founded El Puente. As El Puente's artistic director, she developed El Puente Arts, which is a premier hub for pre professional arts training for youth and a recognized model for community-driven, culturally rooted arts for social change. In 1993, Francis became the founding principal of the El Puente Academy for Peace and Justice, the first public high school in the nation de dedicated to human rights. And in 2002, she became El Puente's executive director and continued to lead the expansion of El Puente's holistic programs and social justice work in North Brooklyn um, and since 2013 in Puerto Rico. Most recently, she stepped down as executive director to assume the role of president of El Puente. Mark Cologne the, um, is the president of the Office of Housing Preservation at, at New York State Homes and Community Renewal. In this capacity, he oversees a multi-agency suite of programs that maintain the state's 450,000 unit affordable housing uh, portfolio. Previously, he served as the deputy general counsel in the same agency, and he practiced public law and real estate law um, at two private firms. He, uh, in addition to serving as chair of El Puente's board, Mark is a director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, and is an active member of the Puerto Rican Bar Association and the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Moving on to our second organization, IBEAM provides both space and support for community of diverse justice-driven artists. IBEAM's annual residency program, highly engaged community of alumni, and advanced tools and resources shows and events helps iBeam's artists bring their work to life and out into the world. And representing iBeam today, we have Roderick Schrock, who's been the executive director of iBeam um, uh, since 2015. Um, he manages the functional capacities of the organization's direct support, in addition to uh, support, in addition to curating initiatives that um, aim to realign society, societal relationships to emergent technologies. He's been an active practitioner in digital and sound art, living and working in Japan, and continuing studies in the Netherlands. And he currently teaches in the Curatorial Pro Practice MA program at the School of Visual Arts. Um, Joe Versazzi is the board chair. He is a principal and senior advisor in the New York office of A.B. B. Bernstein, where he oversees a global investment management advisory practice. A graduate of Boston University, um, he serves as the chair of IBEAM, also chair of the board of trustees for West Beth Artist Housing and vice chair of the board of trustees for the Saki College of Arts and Design in Florence, Italy. Um, his deep civic engagement includes many arts, business, youth and arts social service organization where he has served as or serving as a board member and a volunteer. Um, in addition to his, his professional role, Joe has served and as, as an assistant professor on the faculty of Columbia University's Graduate School of international and public policy from 2011 and 2015. So there's a lot of expertise that's gonna be on the stage here and we're gonna talk about how it has all worked together and been um, drawn upon and called upon uh, since March uh, in a very different way than before. And I wanna remind you that to use the question and answer box to ask questions, 
we will have, I have obviously a bunch of questions for the panelists, but then we'll break and um, we'll be reading from the audience's questions. So use the question and answer box, or if you're calling in, the number is 917-969-9600. And I'll, I'll just say that once more, 917-969-9600. Seven two, if you're on the phone. Um, and then those questions will also go into the pool. So, uh, and one reminder to the panelists, please try to identify yourself as you speak. It just makes it easier on everyone listening. So the first thing that I'm gonna ask is a very broad question. Um, for each one of you, can you tell us about the COVID journey? You know, how has your organization's programming changed? How have your management challenges refocused? You know, it hasn't just been, okay, March 17th, we all closed down and here we still are, but it's been a series of progressions for all of us. Um, and I'm gonna start with El Puente and ask uh, Francis and Mark, uh, please identify yourself and, and give you a description as you start speaking and um, tell us about it. Well, I guess I'll start. Thank you, Judy. Um, thank you, DCLA for having us uh, on this panel today. Um, my name is Frances Lucerna. I'm the co-founder and president of El Puente here in Brooklyn. Uh, I use um, she, her pronouns. I am a woman of color of Puerto Rican and Filipino descent. I have long brown hair. I'm wearing red glasses, a black turtleneck, gold earrings, and I'm sitting in a space with a, a white background, uh, a lace curtain, and a picture on one end of, uh, on behind me. Um, the journey, and, and uh, I think that's a good word for it, the journey. Um, since March and um, this pandemic, uh, this unprecedented time that, uh, that we have all been living in and we've all been um, navigating through. Um, I think for us at El Puente, uh, and certainly um, what has become glaring and have, has really made us all aware, is that you know um, the issues of the pandemic were clearly compounded um, and dire in our community, um, which is a community of color of uh, predominantly Latinx and, and Black um, residents, who uh, clearly a community that has uh, experienced um, uh, racial and social inequities uh, historically and um, for which this pandemic clearly um, had some, has had devastating, devastating impacts. As an organization, um, resiliency and um, being able to address crisis has really been sort of our history and our legacy from the very beginning. When we started in, in 1982 in Los Suras in Williamsburg, um, in the height of uh, real crisis in the community, uh, both socially and infrastructure, uh, violence, um, and institutions um, that were just not even present or not there for our community. And in that, and in that space, um, we chose to focus on the resources and the potential that existed and existed within ourselves as community residents and the residents of, the, of, of Los Uras uh, as a starting place and created a point there's a safe space to really be able to galvanize um, and bring our community together. I think the same thing happened and that was in full force in March. Um, as we started to really understand what would be and, and did uh, occur in terms of the uh, impact on our community, but certainly in terms of our organization with regard to funding and what that would mean for the programming that we have and our programming being quite extensive of direct services and programs to young people and their families, as well as um, advocacy and social justice campaigns that were clearly community rooted. Um, and everything about our practice was building relationship and in person. This building of relationship and community um, together um, is really our, our, our foundation and really the power in terms of our being able to work. So 
put that all together in terms of the moment that we found ourselves in. And as, as a leadership, um, you know, what we were clearly uh, focused on uh, was how and which way we were gonna do the pivot. And pivot has become <laughs> the optimal word, right? Pivot, pivot, pivot. Um, and so everything was going to uh, become virtual and we understood that but then really building capacity within our own organization and among our staff and making the assessment as to what our capacity was both on the side of our staff as well as in terms of our infrastructure to be able to, to make that change uh, and to make that, um, you know, make that leap um, was really uh, a challenge and yet an all and very much in the way of a point, they, a, an opportunity, an opportunity to really look um, at ourselves and in terms of our capacity to diversify the ways in which we communicated with our community and with our young people and to really be able to start thinking about resources not only for ourselves but how would that translate and always translate to access for our community our young people and our families in particular um, and so we made that that transition but in the midst of that transition um, we also then had to anticipate the cuts that were gonna come. Um, some of those were cuts mid-year um, in terms of funding we had received, and some of the cuts were really anticipated funding that then um, did not happen, right? Uh, from, for the reasons that we all know. And really being able to sit um, and work very closely with my senior um, executive team, as well as our fiscal office, to really be able to make clear um, and timely assessments as to where we were and what were, what were the assets, what were the possibilities in terms of um, what we could say we, we solidly had and then match that with the needs um, that we obviously needed to address in those objectives. Um, I think that was really key. It was a, a key in terms of, and I think this is something again that I would you know, what's the principle here, as, as Judy said. And it's really about collective leadership. It's really the way in which we have always operated where everyone um, has a seat at the table. Um, we do even consider our fiscal team, which is, an, is outsourced, um, but have our real partners and see themselves as partners. Um, as part of the, not only the think tank and thinking about how we're um, looking at the present situation, but also really clearly rooted in our mission and in our principles. And I think throughout this pandemic, um, I think really being clear about what our non-negotiables not negotiables are at a point then that's really our mission, we are mission driven and our principles has really been, I think, um, so important in terms of making those strategic decisions. And I think the strategic thinking around this was what and, and how are we going to first and foremost support our staff and make sure that they have clear and consistent information as we move through this and what might be the impacts as we saw in June, the impact was that you know uh, probably almost half of our part-time staff, if not almost all of them were furloughed because of our city funding um, with regard to youth funding, youth development funding. Um, but making sure that in, during that time and up to that moment, we were really bringing staff together, our directors, our coordinators and our staff, really to understand what was going on and what the implications may be, and then creating the support to really be able to sit with staff individually, as well as collectively, to really make sure that we were clear about what their situation was and what were their options. There was one big strategic decision I think we made in the summer, and that's when we did not have our summer programming money and um, was that we made a decision with the money that we had to really keep our, our leadership staff together. And this was all in co conversation and in collaboration with our board, and Mark will talk about that. But to keep our leadership staff together, to um, take advantage as we did of all of the COVID direct relief funding that was out there to create the kinds of direct relief programs for our community and have our leaders, relatively new leadership group, part of that, but also um, to also use that time 
to really create a very intensive leadership um, experience institute where our new leadership was at simultaneous to doing these projects and this direct service were also being having spaces to really talk about the mission, the principles of El Puente, and really our work as social, ju as social justice organization. I think that was pivotal and pivotal in terms of really allowing our leadership to own the mission and to own um, you know, the path forward and to really be inspired. And I will say that that I think was so moving uh, when we did the debrief at the end of the summer and coming into the fall, that the, you know, the, the staff that was part of it, our leadership staff said that, that th this was the most inspiring moment for them being at El Puente because they really felt that they were part of, the, of a movement to really be able to support our families, but also to really manifest the mission and the principles of El Puente. And I think that was really important going into the fall where we were able to bring back some of our furloughed uh, staff, but also to really think of the new direction that we are moving in um, that now incorporates virtual and hybrid. I would say the other thing that I think was very key is, is again with our fiscal team to be able to access a PPP loan. Um, but really understanding in that um, where and how to navigate that and manage that closely. Um, again, communication I think was key and continues to be key. Communication with the board, with our executive team, with our staff, with our members, with our community, with our partners and our networks. And most important, probably with funders. Um, a lot of individual calls to funders funders who called and just checked in and say, hey, how are you guys doing? And also communication individually to funders, just letting them know what we were doing and really keeping them abreast of where we were and where we're going um, and what we might need. And I think, again, just forming that sense of partnership and ownership um, of El Puente and, um, and, the, and, and the work that we're doing, the important work and the vital work as frontline organization to our community. All right, uh, Mark, I wanna hear from you as a board member there. Um, start by introducing yourself of, uh, you know, your visuals. And then the question I'm gonna to pose to you, to, how did the board's role shift in all of this pivoting? You know, and what is it an immediate and constant shift? Did it come in waves? You know, what, what was that like um, on the board part at partnership? Yeah, so um, thank you, Judy. Um, uh, my name is Mark Colon, and uh, I am um, in my, an apartment in, uh, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. I am a, a male a Latino. Uh, I have a shaved head and a scruffy <laughs> beard and a button-down shirt of periwinkle color. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just just... Following up on, you know, Francis spoke, you know, pretty uh, clearly on the uh, responding to the program changes. But uh, I guess I would start by saying that it was just uh, to have the ability of the staff and the leadership to pivot and, and shift the focus of the programming to address the immediate and unforeseen challenges of COVID was really incredible in this in this case. And I think it, we likely benefited from having been established for so long. You know, we've been around for 38 years and so deeply accepted as a part of the community. Um, and from the program staff's sort of relentless focus on community and individual empowerment and self-determination, um, that we had gained the necessary trust to pivot to new programs and getting and still getting community buy-in almost immediately. So I guess um, now not all organizations have such, you know, a long-standing um, uh, relationship or existence. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to start by saying that I think the takeaway for all nonprofits here in this is, um, you know, in the middle of a maelstrom of something like a, you know, global pandemic, I think, um, you know, it was a little, it was daunting at first as the chair of the board of the organization. I, I like to think that, you know, in my, in my professional life, I, I've dealt with a lot of sort of uh, disasters and post Sandy um, here in New York State, uh, you know, um, but uh, honestly, it was a bit scary in terms of the organization and, and the organizational survival. 
but the you know the staff and uh, was just incredible in sort of pivoting and i think the takeaway for other organizations here is to step back and sort of focus on your strengths for a moment in that you know in that moment of sort of um a bit of fear um and though and those strengths can help sort of um shape how you can best um pivot and sort of and contribute to what you your organization does best um great well we'll have some more questions that dig into exactly how we, we do that this is judy levine okay now i'm going to turn to ivim um and i'm going to turn to roderick uh to start the uh conversation and again the question is Tell us about your COVID journey. You know, can you discuss briefly how the organization's programming changed and how the management challenges have refocused? And please start yeah. by you know, introducing yourself visually. Absolutely, thank you, Judy. Uh, this is Roderick um, and I appreciate DCLA for extending this invitation to IBEAM. Um, I was inspired by the Alt Texas Poetry Project by Shannon Finnegan, an artist, um, to uh, create a poetic des description for uh, blind or low vision attendees. Uh, I asked my partner, Juno Luchi Lee, to pen something to, uh, poetic in that regard. Um, it is, I have brown and gray hair, cut short, but floppy on top of my head, as well as brown and gray stubble on my cheeks and around my lips. I have freckles on my face and light skin. I don't wear eyeglasses, but I have thick eyebrows. Judy, to get to your question, I mean, I would say there's so much that Francis and Mark have already shared that just feels incredibly resonant to exactly what we went through with iBeam. And um, and Joe, it feels, feel free to, to chime in as well, perhaps to help fill out any answers to my questions. Um, but I, I think that, you know, for us that, that focusing on your strengths was a huge, huge component as we went into March and beyond. Um, the organization, uh, had for the last six years had been going through some challenges and some transitions and we had been working very hard to create um, a foundation of stability. Um, we had been planning for this year to be one of pretty uh, expansive strategic planning and advancement. We had been working at the board and advisory level to do so. Um, but in March, as we were getting ready to launch our residency program when everything happened, um, we just really had to just fall back onto that back to basics kind of mentality of what is it that we do? What is our mission? How do we realize that mission at this moment? And um, for us, that was similarly again to what Francis and Mark were describing, going into a hybrid and virtual kind of working environment immediately. Well, virtual first, fully virtual. And my first email that I sent to our community after we closed in March was to our artist alumni and artist community asking them what they need. And what I heard back was of course, money. Artists need to be supported. They need to be paid for their work. Um, but I think what I was also hearing was the need for community, uh, for inspiration, for collaboration, for platforms to help get their work out into the world um, and to be involved in rethinking what could emerge out of a moment of systemic crisis. And so that the pivot for us then was to launch um, a new fellowship program, an international, a fully international fellowship program because it was virtual that um, supported 30 artists uh, to really challenge them to think about what an artist led approach to rebuilding and rethinking could be. Um, that program is ongoing. We'll have a culminating event in February uh, that is uh, will, will be more hybrid than the program has been up to this point. I think in terms of the, the, the questions around management um, and sort of board and senior management collaboration, you know, again, it was all about trust. It was about supporting our community, reminding ourselves who our community is and what are the communities that we are getting to know and have been more active in and how can we reach out to them and be supportive and to collaborate and come together and to think about what even fundraising looks like together as groups of, of different types of organizations. Um, Francis, you said it was an opportunity to look at yourselves. And I think that was so true for us as well. Like it was a real moment to just kind of step back 
look in the mirror and think about what our organization is and, and, and what it could be. And to translate that into access and support for um, our community of artists and activists um, throughout New York and the country and the world. Um, but it was but it was that trust to uh, the, the board actually giving myself and the senior management team the full trust and support in our ability to deliver on our mission and our programs was the single most important thing that already existed in many ways, but I think this crisis just brought to the fore and brought to prominence in, in a whole new way. And I think that that's something that, you know, coming out of this um, at some point in the future is going to continue to serve the organization, you know, very, very well. Um, for us, the funding issues were challenging. And to be honest, um, I even have more concerns about the upcoming years, 2021 and beyond, when it comes to uh, maintaining and building on what we can do, because a lot of the emergency kind of funds that have been made available are in no way guaranteed going forward. And uh, how, how do organizations, small organizations like IBEAM, how do we then actually continue building on what we've learned this year in a way that can actually grow and strengthen the organization going forward. And there's there's a horizon out there that is a little unclear to me in that regard. Um, but um, communication with funders was huge as well for us and is something that we, uh, it, it, something we have done in the past, but really took to a new level during this crisis year of just constant and regular communication with our, our longtime supporters as well as new friends and involving them in the process of offering feedback and helping open up access to uh, them with our community as well. Um, that was something that is was just a, a hugely important part of, of our survival uh, throughout this year. Um, So, so Joe, I'm going to ask you um, both to introduce yourself visually, but also to talk about the board's role in all of this. You know, I'm hearing a lot of changes. Um, I know that word pivot, which is about as overused as it can be now. Um, adaptations, severe yeah. adaptations, um, total overhaul adaptations. Um, what was the board's role, um, you know, not necessarily being on the ground, but um, how did it, and did it shift and did it shift right away and you'd step there or did it change? Sure. So um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Judy. And thank you, everyone, for giving us the space today to have this conversation. Uh, my name is Joe Versace. I am the board chair of iBeam. I am a white male with brown, now longer and wavier hair than March. Um, I have gray and brown uh, stubble, and I am sitting in front of a blue painting contemporary that has probably about five different blue shades in it. That's my Zoom background. Um, so Judy, uh, so much of our success in this year is really the result of the hard work of Roddy and the executive committee and the board over the past five and six. Um, if I think about the key factors that were in place that gave us the ability as Roddy discussed and also as um, you know, both uh, Mark and Francis have discussed this, this level of trust. So you know, let me just dimension what that looks like. We had established such a, a rapport working with Roddy and I specifically, you know, we have weekly check-ins. Roddy had just come back from a six week sabbatical that the board had awarded him for his work. And the purpose of the sabbatical was to brainstorm and think about the future and come back with a clear mind. And Roddy and I met two days before the lockdown to welcome him back and to have a conversation about this kind of epidemic that we were hearing about, but we were very laser focused as we are in terms of the mission of the organization. So Roddy was fresh and had the clear thinking of time away that he came back into, which was a major factor. You know, why was Roddy on a sabbatical? Well, that's a combination of both how Roddy shows up to his practice every day and the strength and trust of the collective board and team that we knew that Roddy could do this. We knew the team in place could manage the organization without him. 
because the board is very clear that what our job is and what where our lane is in the daily interaction with the organization. Um, you know, we're here to guide and advise the chief executive. Um, we're not here to manage the day to day. Um, we're, you know, here to serve as a cabinet of advisors from multiple backgrounds and multiple disciplines to be able to give the executive director a real, you know, heterogeneous view of the work and the world that they live in. Um, and we're very clear that what we're not, you know, we're not, we don't do the job of the staff on a day to day basis. And coming into this experience with those pillars, if you will, and those real guide, you know, the, the guides of understanding of how we behave. Um, my first conversation with Roddy when we learned that we were going to have to shut down was let's make sure everybody's safe and let's make sure everyone's healthy. And then let's figure out who we are in this space. And there's, there's, there must be opportunities for us. And we've got to focus on what the opportunities are and not on the unknowns and not on the trauma of what's happening, but keep our head clear, you know, and, and not let every single person in the ecosystem be pulled down into the, into the um, hole of the pandemic, because then we're going to have no perspective. And so We've, you know, in terms of changes to your question, Judy, directly, nothing really changed for our relationship. Um, we, we um, as a group of, of governors at the board level, uh, several years ago, we empowered the executive committee to be really be an operating committee. And therefore, if staff and leaders needed quick feedback or approvals or conversations, the three or four of us could get on the phone very quickly and empower the leader to go forward and have some oversight there. Um, and then we kept the greater board up to date as, as necessary, but it was really building off of the strength and, and keeping a focus on not being distracted by, again, the trauma, but understanding what it was and being able to always be, have a outside in view that our mission was aligned with what was happening and that we weren't creeping into a new space that we couldn't survive in just as a response. Right, I, I wanna actually dive into one of the board's roles, which I would assume got heightened in this period, which is um, managing risk. Um, and both the, from the board perspective, I wanna share that first, and then um, from a staff perspective. So, you know, what, you know, what kind of risks were the board paying attention to and what role did the board play? And then what did you feel that staff's job was? So Joe or Mark, and then just Mark, who you are. Mark, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, um, this is not Mark. Uh, yeah. uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I just wanted to introduce you because if people are on the phone, they won't oh, yeah. know. This is Mark. Um, so uh, in terms of managing risk, um, you know, it, uh, I, kind of have to be honest that in the situation that we were in, a lot of it was reactive, you know, um, you know, managing risk is all about, you know, being sort of prospective or thinking prospectively um, and, you know, putting in, putting in procedures to sort of to deal with things. This was a unique once in a lifetime situation that you had to respond to, right? Um, and so, but, but again, sort of, Staying with the theme before of, um, I think, well, I like to think of it in terms of short-term and long-term risks and objectives for the, from a board perspective. You know, short-term, we were obviously most concerned with organizational survival and with sort of providing the type of programming that became immediately <laughs> needed in, the, in our community. Um, and so, from a board perspective, I could I could say you know we became more collaborative and more nimble, um, both at the same time. Um, collaborative in the sense of of being available and sort of participating much more frequently in the in the financial discussions um, with Francis and the finance team who were just incredible <laughs> at keeping things together um, and identifying new opportunities um, and um, and just sort of. Uh, dedicating as much you know personal time as possible to sort of acting as a resource, filling in um, for the staff on certain things if possible. Um, and long term, 
I think it was the risk was sort of getting pulled in completely 100% to the short term responses. So keeping focused and keeping our eyes on the from a board perspective, I think that's really something that you can sort of contribute to a staff that is that is dealing with the day to day. Um, so we had long discussed a, a founders transition succession plan um, among the board uh, leadership uh, uh, originated with Luis, Luis and Francis and Gino, um, our founders. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we were able to, you know, keep that on track um, and, um, you know, come form a subcommittee that sort of to do, to do all the necessary vetting and all. Um, and I'm very proud of uh, both, you know, uh, the board and, and the leadership team's um, ability to, to keep that focus on the long term and get that really critical critical aspect of the organization. You know, when you think of it, organizational existence, again, in the context of a, of a, a global pandemic, you're, it's very easy to think to think 100% short term, but um, that long term is really sets up a lot of the questions that you um, that you had raised um, earlier, Judy, in our preparation in terms of, you know, approach to finance uh, and fundraising issues, um, you know, Pivot, pivot on 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 um, that sort of that leadership, bringing in that new leadership and sort of starting to uh, make the round, so to speak. Okay, um, how about Joe? What about um, IBEAM and how you pivoted uh, and how you the board um, managed and and how they thought about risk and did that change? Sure. So uh, this is Joe Versace again from IBEAM. Um, you know our first. Our first concern was the people. <laughs> um, it was the human aspect. Um, so our first conversations, Roddy and mine, were: Are all of our folks safe? Are they all? Do they have what they need? Are they? You know, what's their individual experience like in this in this storm of unknown? Um, the next level immediately following was the lives of our residents who had come from all over the world to come be with us, and we were shut down. And so we had people who were away from home, um, not with no community, uh, having just arrived. And we were in, an, again, another uh, storm of the unknown. So our first dimension was, what's the humanity here? What do we have to do to make sure everybody is provided for and healthy and has the information they need? And then to Mark's point, we moved into the, the notion of, and, and look from where I come from, my day job is, managing the assets of more, I work with more than 15 boards around the world of, of managing um, the, the, for the organization's finances. So risk factor is always very, very high on my list. So Roddy and I and the executive committee, um, you know, essentially went into a triage mode of what are those risks? And for us, they became well, we're paying a lot of money for a space we're not occupying. Um, we are an in-place residency. You know, that's what we're known for. We are a convener. Um, so the risk is, uh, can we still offer those things? You know, is this new environment conducive to the types of way we convened and, and aggregated the, the information in the past? Um, and then, uh, understanding the fixed costs and the, the real uncertainty about funding is, is really where Roddy and his senior team went to work. And we ended up in a year raising money from foundations that we had relationships with, but not funding relationships prior. And, um, and that gave us a, a little bit of a, a buoyancy to be able to understand that we were gonna sustain ourselves but then really continued, Judy, to your, to your question, risk, managing risk was a day-to-day -day situation, um, both organizationally and, and from, our, from our workforce standpoint. Yeah, you actually talked, this is Judy Levine, um, you talked about fundraising, and that's a question that I have. Um, you know, it's always uh, an issue of board focus or should be, um, and what does that partnership look like? 
but I, I'm interested in how your board members adapted because there are two, uh, two big changes. One is the changed avenue for connection that you know there's no in-person gatherings in-person intimate you know you can't bring them to you know have lunch with uh francis and press the flesh so to speak um you know one-to-one -one consultation so those avenues had to change and then even how you represent the organization that um el puente isn't doing the things ibeam isn't doing the activities that you could that a board member will describe so how does how, how did board members learn how to talk about the organization when um, your, the value to the world was different, but the activities were not the same? And I'm going to start again with board members. I'm just putting you on the spot, but this is about governance and we're getting a sense of how board members think. And I, I say that also as being a board member myself. Sure. So, um, I'll, Mark, if you don't mind, this is Joe Versace. Um, you know, for us, Judy, again, I, I, I know this is boring for the folks who are participating, but so much of our governance um, had been thought out and strengthened and lived as an experience prior to the pandemic. So when the way that we work from a fundraising perspective and the way we've always worked in the past is that Roddy and his team lead that initiative and come to the board for experiential support or guidance, right? So there's a board member who might have a connection, might be the right person to be a part of the dialogue, might be the right person to make the introduction. And so it becomes very personalized for us on fundraising, which is you know, such a big term and concept, mm -hmm. but it's the, the initiative is owned by the staff and by the leadership organizationally and, and has been. And I believe that as a result of that, it's why we had such institutional support this year is that this our board is not a board where I go and talk to my three friends and we raise $100,000 and then we move on. You know, our support is a real quilt of relationships and experiences and contexts so that when we were stressed and when the system was stressed, we didn't lose a dimension of it. We, we had a really, you know, I'm thinking of those, it's a really, really rudimentary, rustic example of those potholders we used to make when we were kids on the screen. You know, like this was a woven, strong base of fundraising that was not predicated on starmanship or any one individual's network or, personal wealth. So Mark, can you talk about that from El Puente? And then you had the added level that you were going through a founder transition, which yep. is also an interesting fundraising moment. Yep, yep. And that certainly plays into this question. But I, I just wanted to start by saying, um, contrary to what Joe just said, you know, I did just pick up the phone and, and make three calls and we raised about $500,000. <laughs> Go for it. No, we're absolutely <laughs> We're absolutely not an organization like that. And I guess I just wanted to start by saying, to, to be honest with El Puente, the programming and the leadership has nearly always uh, made it easy by attracting the funding themselves. Um, you know, and, and this goes into the transition question and, and uh, or issue and the need for the uh, dynamic to kind of be converted to uh, where, um, you know, we have a board that's kind of organic it's grown up with the organization. It's it's largely, um, I'd say, eighty percent. It's people who were actually youth members of El Puente uh, as they were growing up, um, and um, and again, sort of uh, with Francis and Luis and the programming itself leading the uh, fundraising. Um, but during this time, um, given what I spoke about before and sort of the just amazing ability to use that or to adapt, so to speak, on the program staff to meet the, the, the real and immediate needs of the communities, both here in Brooklyn and in Puerto Rico. Um, I was relentless in using my social media accounts and in working with El Puente, which had Francis um, brought a woman, Yolanda, uh, uh, on board who did, who's done a terrific job of updating our social media accounts working collaboratively. And I really pushed the board to uh, make sure that, you know, every social media account that you have that has more than 10 followers, 
should know about the good work, the incredible work. You know, we're all so proud of, of uh, you know, when we come to a board meeting and, um, you know, Asenet Gomez, the director of programs, reports on these amazing, we can almost not believe how sort of, how, um, uh, con um, what a con uh, sort of significant contribution to the uh, effort that, that's being made by this organization that we're sort of chairing. We have an obligation to get that word out because, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around to hear it, you know, does it really make a sound? And so I, I think in this day and age, I think that social media um, can really make a difference, even, even emails, you know, even emails, uh, you know, I have a fairly extensive email list of, you know, they're not the sort of people that control, you know, millions of dollars in, in, in funding, um, but they are the sorts of people that can and will give a hundred, 200, 500, a thousand dollars to a really genuine pitch, you know? Um, and I've sort of taken, I've made it my business and I've worked with the other board members to sort of fashion um, a real sort of uh, ins inspirational pitch to sort of just just frame what the what the board is doing and sort of uh, build build both both not just fun from a funding perspective but from a networking perspective right good word that that the good word about somebody um, uh, that you know the is our reputation is the best sort of selling point that we have so I'm going to encourage people, we're going to go to questions in about five minutes. So I'm going to encourage people to put your questions into the question and answer box. And if you're calling on the phone, I actually switched to the numbers. I apologize. The phone number is 917-969-6072. So you can either phone your questions in or write them in the chat box. I'm going to, I have two more questions to go before we go to the general questions. And one is a question for the EDs. You know, we, we're, we're hearing about, you know, cultural organizations, institutions losing staff, um, and so much is on the executive director's shoulders. On the other hand, we're hearing, you know, how can board members help? But we don't necessarily want them in there. And I, now I have my ED hat on doing our business. Um, so how can board members help without veering sort of too close into operations? And Rodney, Rodney I'm gonna start with you and then I'll go to you, Francis. Well, I mean, I think the, the biggest thing for us anyway is just knowing that at the end of the day, the board is there to support the mission of the organization, you know, just going back to basics. And when we start from there, then you know that we have um, a group of astoundingly committed, energetic, and engaged people that we can turn to uh, for advice, for um, connections, for problems um, and to know that that kind of um, sustaining element is always there and literally just you know has your back like that that's that's huge and I think that's kind of you know where, where we start from I think um, from from there it really I mean in our case yeah in those early days there was a there were there was a moment where we were really going back to the drawing board and thinking about what what does it take for us to sustain ourselves through this year and working with the board to think that through quantitatively and qualitatively um, was very uh, very it was a very very necessary exercise because then we were able to sort of game out several different paths that so we knew that we ha would have options uh, depending on whatever junction we, we came to um, and Truly, the team at iBeam is is astounding in that there's a, such a sense of commitment to the mission of the organization that team members themselves uh, were very uh, had a huge amount of input in terms of crafting ways that we could navigate uh, as we needed to uh, to make sure that we were doing our we were delivering on our mission, doing in our work, and 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 keeping everyone uh, with the organization. Uh, in the process. And we were very fortunate in that there were emergency measures that we were able to access both from the private uh, and public realms that allowed us to um, maintain operations, staffing, and our mission 
in a way that got us through um, while radically changing everything that we did in the process. And so it was it was a really um, it was very much a all hands on deck situation. It was very much a here's here's a hundred different ways this could unfold. How do we thread the needle to live our values and deliver our mission? Um, and how do we do that in a way that is supportive to our community of artists and and the team that you know the organization wouldn't exist uh, without the team you know otherwise. Um, so it it was it it it's and it's constantly evolving. And I, I mentioned this the other day in conversation, Judy and Francis. Um, I'm, this is one of the first moments I've had to actually start to sit down and process this year, to be perfectly honest. Um, it's not over. And those, the, the kinds of trajectories that we've been mapping out this year, we're continuing to do that going into the next year. This, this is not the end of uh, this, this moment in any way. In many ways, I feel like it's, it's a, maybe a turning of the page, um, but there are so many unknowns uh, looking, looking ahead that um, it's it's an ongoing process, and again, we've we've been fortunate in many ways, um, but it's the the challenges remain. Um, and I think as you all feel similarly, this this crisis in many ways has just brought to the fore so many issues that we've all been dealing with for so many years. I guess in the glass half full sort of way, that's that that's been a very clarifying process in a positive sense. Uh, but of course, I mean, it's, it's the, the challenges are, are, are continuing. Francis, so the question is really, how can uh, board members help with everything that's on your shoulders without veering too close into operations? Um, yes, uh, you know, I, I was just listening to um, Roderick and, and, and so much of what Roderick was saying, of course, resonates and resonates deeply um, with you know, the moment that we found ourselves in and the moment that we are in. I think, uh, you know, two things come to mind and really going back to this idea of risk and risk management and, um, and the relationship um, of the board. Um, you know, I, I feel language is important and, 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 in, and for me and, and how we've been looking at it is there's risk, but there's also um, a way to think about this and flip it is investment. What are we invested in? Um, that starts with our mission and our principles, um, translates to our people, um, staff, and our, our, our members, um, our community. Um, but in that, I think, is it, that lens, using that lens to make strategic decisions that are just not about the moment and the moment in terms of what is needed and those objectives to fulfill that, but really looking at the long term in terms of preparedness and sustainability, uh, because having been here almost 40 years, our investment is to be here for another 40 years, right? And then those strategic decisions are predicated on that. And I think this decision to move forward with a founder's transition amidst incredible, um, incredible circumstances, not the least of which was the passing of our founder uh, two years ago. Um, and what trauma that was for all of us and myself, particularly in terms of our partnership and our life partnership, but for the, the organization became a galvanizing moment of really understanding and being committed to an investment in the legacy and being a living legacy, which I think really drove us to really think about those strategic decisions going forward and, uh, and looking at risk in that, in that context. I think in terms of your question, Judy, I think it's really, it comes from a real clear understanding, trust and respect to what we bring to you know, our commitment to that living legacy of the point in the work and the necessary and important work that we do and who, who what we bring as a um, a staff and what we bring as a board. Um, for me, as, as um, the executive director and, and, and the leader of El Puente, what I have most appreciated, and it was alluded to in, in what Joe sp spoke about and, and you, Rod, and, and certainly as you have heard, Mark, is really creating a safe space for me <laughs> mm -hmm. and for our, our executive team, you know, to just really a safe space to really you know, just really reflect and really just share 
um, this is a really lonely place to be often with huge responsibility um, to hold space for everyone else and make decisions that will affect deeply the lives of everyone, you know, staff and members and participants. And, and, and so having someone just beyond a thought partner, but someone who is truly invested and caring like Mark and board members to just hold the space <laughs> um, and just kind of, you know, exhale and then find that space to do some clear thinking. Uh, which is almost a, a sabbatical of the mind, right? <laughs> a sabbatical of the soul and the spirit. And I think that that's what I have most appreciated um, in terms of the relationship, certainly with Mark and the board, with our incredible, incredible senior staff. And, um, and I, think, I, I think it's not something that's talked about and acknowledged and honored often when we talk about, um, you know, leadership in the context of board and executive directors um, is really, you know, the aspect of our humanity in all of this um, and how in which way we first and foremost um, take care uh, and are mindful of our humanity in all of this so that we can move from that place to make those important and strategic um, decisions um, that, you know, will affect everyone involved. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, for us at Opuente to be able to be in this moment where we, we have brought on a new executive director, Marco Carion, and who will join the team um, of this out amazing uh, deputies that I have, um, Asnet and Helen, um, and the staff and the way we've been able to do this and with the board, um, I think is a signal. It's really, it's really a message. You know, um, it really, when you talk about the profile of the organization, how do you talk about the organization and the future of the organization. I think a moment like this for El Puente really speaks to our resilience and our commitment to moving forward and to um, creating the capacity, leadership capacity to continue to nurture another generation and generations of leaders that will do this work. Okay, um, so there, I'm looking at the questions and there's, there's a couple of questions that I'm gonna uh, combine and pose to the board chairs on this. And, I, and I'm gonna talk first about the board chair's role as being the manager of the board team. Um, and these questions, you know, obviously we chose the, the panelists because there were active boards that were rising to the challenge. Um, and, but some, not all of our nonprofits have board leaders and even for your nonprofits, I'm sure that not every board member rose to the challenge in the same way. So how do you work with board members and, and a board, if you've been there, that is not, um, that is not rising to this challenge of, of being actively at the table? Did you run into that at all? And how did you, how did you what were your strategies for, for working with that? I could, I could go, this is Mark uh, with El Puente. Um, by sort of just mentioning one particular point or instance, um, you know, I mentioned before that the board uh, had stepped up significantly in terms of following through on the long-term transition plan um, and forming a committee and doing the hard work. And then there were a couple of other instances uh, and a couple of other needs where, you know, um, we really needed, I really needed some collaboration from, from the board. Um, and from a chair's perspective, um, you know, this is a little bit, I, I try to do it in a way that's not pedantic or patronizing, but, you know, I literally reminded them in asking, in asking for their, you know, for volunteers that the most important work that they're going to do is not during the board, the mo their most important participation is not in the board meeting itself, it's in the work in between the board meetings that we're reporting out, that we're reporting out or reporting into during the board meetings, where you may just get strategic, you know, advice during the during the board meeting, but that work in your in the subcommittees, that work in sort of whatever you're doing collaboratively, maybe if, you, if you're working with any of the programs, that's really sort of what will keep the organization going and vibrant uh, uh, because the board is really dealing with the, the bigger picture questions. And if those bigger picture questions don't get answered and the board members don't step up, um, 
it, it can really be a problem. So I, you know, I just reminded them of that. Uh, and this is Joe Versace from iBeam. Uh, you know, I think when I when I think about your question, Judy, to me, what comes up is, you know, what I view as the primary responsibility of a chair, which is to, you know, understand the folks that they represent both internally and on the board and work individually to get the most from a contribution perspective out of each individual that's not necessarily dollar you know, generated. And so Roddy and I um, you know, have always partnered to understand, okay, who do we have in our universe on the board that could aid, assist, advise, be additive to a particular task or effort that the team was working on and then partnering the individual with the energy or the, ex the experience. And so for us in this particular time frame, Roddy did a brilliant job. And you know, now at, with our established relationship, I'm not a conduit to the board for Roddy. I am an equal member of the board. And if Roddy needs to talk to our treasurer, he speaks to our treasurer, he doesn't call me. If he needs to speak to our vice chair, if he needs to speak to two of the artists who are on the board, he just interacts with them as an as needed basis. But I would say, you know, going back to your earlier question around risk and board, I do think what's come up for us and what we've been talking about is, you know, understanding correlations within the board and making sure that we have not only the diversification that we all talk about, that is based on an individual's, um, you know, race and belief and system, but it's also about where the people come from, right? Because when you have a crisis and it hits everyone, is your board 100% in the line of fire of being hit by that crisis? And certainly in the not-for-profit world in 2008 and 2009, we all learned that an over-reliance on, as an example, Wall Street people on the board um, is a problem when Wall Street crashes or is a problem when something, when there's an infection or a problem within a, a cohort. And so what we've really reflected on as Roddy and I've looked at our board is while we're still working on the notion of making sure our board looks like America, the real thing that we've, we've been, we've, we're proud of is that each and every board member contributes something of real value to Roddy and the mission and the team. And that those aggregated, that sum of the parts is really the magic of, of this group and of IB. Well, that leads into the next question, which is has to do with recruitment um, and uh, both past and, and how do you recruit now when you're not at cocktail parties, where you, when it's hard to bring people to press the flesh or see the organization's work in person? Has that continued and, and how? Well, we actually had that, <laughs> that exact conversation scripted um, word for word um, about a month or two ago. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and again, what we're, we're doing there is we're, we're going back to our knitting and understanding, you know, what are the values that we represent? What are the energies that we need that combine that can make us better? And Roddy and team and board collectively are, as he, Roddy talked about, about the future. This is our one of our big mandates for coming into 21 is, is using the creativity and the depth of relationships that the team and the alumni have and understanding how we convert that or utilize that as a platform to engage with folks that we haven't met yet and or that we know and that we want to um, have deeper conversations with about perhaps joining joining the board and and keeping in mind governance at this time of you know terms and 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 classes and and titles and all of that that the the, the basic governance has to continue and for us basic governance is always making sure that we're not trying to grow a board of numbers but we're trying to grow a board of real substance and collaboration and unique perspectives. So I know I didn't give you a tangible work effort, but it's because we just don't have it right now. You know, we're, we're doing, Roddy's doing the work of 
making the contacts and setting up one-on-one -on -one conversations, et cetera. And we're going to um, riff with this in the first quarter and see what starts to stick and get some feedback. But our goal in the year is to have cracked the code, if you will, on how to interact with folks when you can interact with folks in pre-COVID ways. Mm -hmm. Mark, yeah. weigh in. So, um, I'd have to say that we have um, been lucky in terms of sort of an ad hoc approach, um, um, despite the efforts of many people, including I believe Judy, to sort of to get us to adopt a sort of a, a more systematic approach to board <laughs> recruitment. Um, and I think it grows out of sort of the nature of the organization and sort of our deep, deep commitment to our principles and whether or not somebody we're going to bring on is going to be sort of as committed to those principles when Joe mentioned before a board full of Wall Street executives. I, <laughs> I'm sure that Francis chuckled inside, right? Um, and so, uh, like I, I said, we've been sort of lucky um, in terms of ad, ad hoc some folks that, the folks I think that Francis and, and I just personally have suggested and we've added to the board have turned out to be a couple of the most active members of the board itself. But I think with the transition um, and with Marco coming on board, um, that subject is absolutely a primary one to have with Marco and Francis and the leadership in terms of um, not just board recruitment, but board expansion and board diversification um, uh, to deal with kind of, you know, to make sure that we're not in a situation like Joe, that Joe sort of um, described where, you know, some issue or some risk comes along that affects 100% of the board members because we're all, you know, in the not-for-profit or government world or, you know, um, or where, you know, 50% attorneys. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I think that is, uh, while we've been lucky in one sense and the other sense, it's definitely um, an area with, uh, in the new transition that uh, will be a priority for us. Okay, I'm going to ask you a little bit of a personal question, but I think it's really important for not only the board members to hear in the audience, but the executive directors to hear. How have you as board members been able to juggle your personal concerns in this period of time with your board responsibilities? And how can the organization be respectful and supportive of you? So, Joe, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. Um, well, to Roddy's point, I think I'm still unpacking this, you know, the, the notion of, of what the years meant and what's been, you know, what are the learnings about success and, and time. Um, you know, as you stated, Judy, in my, in the intro, I not only chair IBEAM's board, but I also chair the board of West Beth Housing um, in the West Village, and I also vice chair of Fine Arts College in Florence. Um, the truth of the matter is, which is not something that I would advise in terms of replication, is that the way this year has worked is that we've been working seven days a week and we're, there's no real extra time in our day if we're civically inclined. You know, this has been a time when all volunteer firefighters have been called to the front. And I think that from, <clears throat> you know, Roddy's and my perspective, we check in with each other on time and time away. Um, we encourage each other to take time and cover each other in that time and had to learn truthfully how to manage all of these energies, you know, as, as Mark was referring to in terms of diversification of board, you know, for me, the big learning is while it's important to me to have a civic aspect of my life, having leadership responsibility for three arts organizations during a pandemic is a very high corollary. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, the folks that I would call on for funding, et cetera, I was having to make the hard decision of, am I making, a, which, which organization am I calling for and which group of folks am I, am I, am I looking to? So I think that the notion that Roddy and team had, had adopted prior, which is we have very clear and often communication, we have respect for each other's time. And quite frankly, um, she's not on the call, but 
my colleague, Ali Coy, who works for me at the firm has been my, um, my lifeline in this entire year because she's been my front line of defense working with Roddy and Ellen at West Beth and the, the team at, at, at Saatchi of trying to wedge, you know, time in where there wasn't time to address it. And so um, I, I know going forward, there's certainly thinking around the role of chair and the role of other board members and diversifying some of the work efforts so that everything's not landing on the desk of the executive director and the board chair. Okay, Mark, can you tackle that now? You know, how have you been able to um, juggle personal concerns with board responsibilities and how can the organization be supportive and respectful of that? Yeah, I guess I would just echo everything that Joe said, <laughs> almost, almost verbatim. Um, you know, I, I uh, with the question before Judy that you asked about um, with respect to the executive directors, you know, I, I think, you know, Francis is a real life superhero, you know, uh, as, as was Luis. Um, and it's easy to sort of just take that for granted and, you know, uh, their constant effort and sort of, um, uh, but, but from a board leader's perspective, um, I think it was said in a different way before, but I think it's critical to, for me to check in with Francis and just personally and see how she's doing, just at, create a space, you know, without the talk about the, about, you know, what the latest crisis is or where our strategic programming is, our strategic plan, um, just how are you doing personally? And, and I've, you know, it's almost shocking to hear Francis, when Francis, you know, admit some sort of, um, uh, shortcoming or, or, or fear or something, but just flipping that sort of to the quest, the specific question here about um, board members, um, you know, I've always been, <laughs> I've achieved from where I came from, I've achieved quite a bit in life, but I've always been motivated by fear of failure, you know, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> constantly. And, um, and I joined this board uh, you know, um, I'm asked to join a lot of boards, um, and um, I joined. But when I was asked, I literally was hoping that Luis Francis would ask me to join the only not-for-profit board that I was hoping they would uh, to be asked to join, and I did. Um, and I am, I am sort of motivated not by fear, but by the just also by the sort of the ability or the the idea of going to bed knowing that, you know, I've helped to make some contribution, you know, uh, and um, so I get personally, despite, you know, maybe despite sometimes the time or the pressure challenges posed by the organization and my, my fear of the, you know, uh, of presiding over the, the demise of, a, of an iconic organization, particularly in the Latino community, um, you know, it, it also, it also the organization and my participation and the work that, that uh, El Puente does and continues to do and the ability to contribute to the future of that sort of um, gives me a lot of um, um, additional energy, sort of a, the ability to cope with other problems in life. Hey, Judy, just one quick one, one uh, following point is that I also think that as folks look at recruiting board members, this experience has given us a new category of observation and we're, as we're choosing people to join the board, right? It's this notion of when the, when the, when the crisis happens, like we've all experienced, are you, do you have the time? Do you have the finances? Do you have the network that can stand up to the challenge? Because this isn't, to your dimensioning of earlier days, you know, this was not for the board member who liked to come to four or five board meetings a year and have a cookie and use it as networking and kind of like to the cause. This year required folks who were on the board to really check in with their commitment to their cause and, and stand up. And I think the stakes have been raised for all of us in the community that have time and space available for civic engagement is to understand the real serious responsibility it means to even have a conversation, as Mark dimensions, by of joining a board or considering someone to join a board. That this isn't for play. This is a real serious business and people's lives 
livelihoods and health are, are at stake with the work that we do. Okay, well on that note, um, I'm gonna close us out by thanking uh, Roderick, Joe, Francis and Mark and the staff at DCLA for putting this together. And I wanna say that this is not the end. The Department of Cultural Under Affairs understands what a tough time this is for cultural board members as well as staff. And we are here for you. We're planning a series of follow-up discussion sessions for board members of DCLA funded organizations. A mixture of peer support, extra advice, expert advice, I will be facilitating those sessions, a place to unload and come out refreshed. And we'd like to find out who's interested in these sessions. So there's gonna be a link to a survey to gauge your interest and find out what you'd like to talk about that will appear in an email in your inbox shortly. If you are a board member of a DCLA funded nonprofit, I understand not everybody in this room is, but if you are, or if you can forward it to a board member, there's any chance you might be interested in these sessions, um, please fill out the survey. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back on to, over to Perry Ann, but I wanna end by saying thank you to every one of us in this virtual room. It has not been an easy road to hoe being a cultural board member or staff for the nine months, last nine months, and it doesn't look to be getting too much easier in the immediate term. Um, know this, that your work, your concern, your loyalty, your due diligence and courage in the face of incredible adversity is an essential part of pulling this sector through. And now I'll turn it back to Perry Ann from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Thank you, Judy. Um, I just want to applaud all of you and um, say that, Judy, I totally agree with all of you, what you just said. Uh, so on behalf of the Department of Cultural Affairs, I would like to thank today's participants for providing this with a particularly frank and um, I think inspiring conversation. And we really appreciate your generosity and your willingness to share your stories. So thanks, Judy, Francis, Mark, uh, Roderick, and Joe. And a final reminder, one more time, that you will receive three follow-up emails, one about the survey, uh, two to notify you when, um, when the recording of this session is, will be posted on DCA's website, and, uh, and to uh, an invitation to participate in the uh, board-focused sessions that Judy just mentioned. So we thank you for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.